case after a non-adoption of a proposed decision by an administrative law judge. What we'll do this morning is first we'll hear from counsel for the applicant for Dr. Rodriguez, then we will hear, or for would be Dr. Rodriguez, uh, then we hear from counsel for the people, for the Attorney General's office, for the complainant. Uh, we will hear for 15 minutes from each side, uh, and that time will include some time in case any of the panel members have questions for each counsel. After we've done that, I will permit the applicant's counsel another five minutes, as well as the complainant's counsel another five minutes to respond to any issues that have come up, to present additional argument, or to hear any other questions that the panel members might have. Uh, when we've concluded that argument, then the panel will retire into closed session to deliberate on the matter. <clears throat> Uh, before we begin hearing argument, I will ask counsel for each party to identify themselves from the record, and we'll begin with counsel for the applicant, please. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Michael Firestone on behalf of the applicant. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Deputy Attorney General Larry Mercer for the board. Good morning to both of you. Mr. Firestone, how would you like to begin this morning? I would like to proceed with some oral argument, and then I'm going to allow uh, Dr. Rodriguez uh, to make a presentation as well. All right, that's fine. Dr. Rodriguez certainly can speak. Uh, if he does speak, I'll swear him in, but if you'd like to begin, you may. Thank you, Honor. Good morning, everybody. My name is Michael Firestone. I represent the applicant. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning and uh, explain to you why the proposed decision should be adopted and that Dr. Rodriguez is worthy of an unrestricted medical license. And can to keep my portion of the presentation as brief as possible to allow the panel to hear from Dr. Rodriguez himself. The proposed decision should be uh, adopted. The facts and legal um, conclusions were well founded in the proposed decision. And Dr. Rodriguez should be uh, granted unrestricted medical license as he has met his burden of proving that he is worthy of an unrestricted medical license. The proposed decision, um, the ALJ got the facts correct. They were detailed, accurate, and comprehensive. And the proposed decision weighed and analyzed the evidence correctly. Dr. Rodriguez meets and exceeds the requirements for licensure in California. It only requires one year of postgraduate training or internship year for a US-based graduate for medical school. And Dr. Rodriguez has more than three years of postgraduate training under his belt. <clears throat> Dr. Rodriguez uh, completed more than three years of postgraduate training of a seven-year neurosurgery program. And neurosurgery is one of the most competitive residencies there is. During residency, he was exposed to not just neurosurgery. Several of the rotations included uh, multiple disciplines. Therefore, he um, certainly has enough uh, education and training to meet the basic requirements. Although Dr. Rodriguez did not realize when he had matched with the program that this particular residency program was being closely matched uh, by the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, or ACGME, it was specifically being watched and monitored for duty hour violations. ACGME requires no more than 80 hours of uh, duty per week. It was also being watched because it was, a known, it was known to have significant intimidation permeating within the program and retaliation. It was also uh, noted by the ACGME that it was cited for significant concerns for service to education and balance, meaning that the ACGME was concerned that the, the program director was not there and in making sure that the educational needs of the residents were being met. Significant number of support personnel were um, lost within the program during that period of time, which also made the workload for residents much higher than normal. 
So what changed between his PGY-1 year and his PGY-2 year? After the PGY-1 year, he was determined to have met his level of training. So what changed? The significant fact that changed was that after his graduating the PGY-1 year, ACGME came there and had a site visit. And Dr. Rodriguez was interviewed by the ACGME site monitors. And he reported truthfully his, his concerns about the program. And his program director realized that he was the one that had made those reports. So this put him at directly at odds with the program, especially the program director and the chief resident. So he was chastised by the program for reporting honestly his duty hours. He soon realized that uh, the other residents, how did they keep their hours down? Well, they intentionally underreported their hours in order to not antagonize the program's director. <clears throat> so Dr. Litovsky, the program director who wrote the um, review letters and evaluation letters, his letters should be interpreted with a dose of skepticism because he had a, a significant bias against Dr. Rodriguez. <clears throat> and the complainants expert, Dr. Nuovo, um, he based all of his opinions on hearsay, which is improper based on People v. Sanchez, a California Supreme Court case from 2016, which stands for the fact that an expert is not supposed to make a case-specific um, uh, only case-specific testimony about, based on hearsay. And Dr. Nuovo should have been on notice that this program was on, essentially on notice by ACGME itself. And it, it, it basically made Dr. Nuovo um, on notice to look further into the applicant's application. Because Dr. R Rodriguez specifically noted in his um, application his concerns about the program in his narrative letter. So it's undisputed that ACGME was concerned about this particular program and this particular program's uh, director. These were not unsubstantiated claims by Dr. Rodriguez you know, as an excuse for why he did not finish a residency. Multiple areas of the non-compliance that ACGME were concerned about were the exact same issues that Dr. Rodriguez reported and experienced. <clears throat> so this is a program that was permeated by fear and intimidation. Uh, the residents were scared to speak up, and, this, and the residents were overworked. So what, what happened was that this program director essentially pressured this resident who ended up scoring the highest uh, score on the uh, neurosurgery board that any resident had ever scored at that school during his PGY-3 year. So that means he had completed three years of a very intensive competitive residency program and even graduated into his fourth year, where he wasn't, unfortunately, given credit for his fourth year, but he still worked for, for many months. So in this case, probation is unnecessary. Terms and conditions would be unnecessary. Discipline against this, li uh, this, this doctor's license uh, would stay on his record forever. Monitoring is unnecessary. He has three times more experience than any other a uh, typical applicant who has completed only their one-year uh, internship, PGY one year. Otherwise, the board would have to put those kinds of restrictions on anybody who made a, an application with only one year. Why have that requirement? It's a definitely a slippery slope. Dr. Rodriguez is worthy of a unrestricted medical license and has met his burden of proof. <clears throat> he does not pose any danger to the patients in California. He had significant number of uh, support letters from all of the uh, uh, colleagues that he trained with, and many of the attendings that spent a lot more time with him than Dr. Latovsky did, and he's going to explain a lot of this himself. The uh, proposed decision found that he had provided uh, 
credible testimony and that he would be able to, to practice independently. The pros, pros decision should be adopted. And at this point, I'd like to hand over the reins to Dr. Rodriguez so you can hear from himself. Hi, Dr. Rodriguez, would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you will give to this panel will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Please go ahead. Okay. And I'll let you know that you have about six minutes out of your 15 remaining. Um, please stop me when I'm getting close. Uh, there's obviously a lot of information that I would like to share with you guys uh, to help clarify and help to elaborate on some of the details we've already provided to you, but I'm just going to try and stay brief. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I would be more than happy. I would love to clarify anything that you guys are uncertain about. And Your Honor, uh, sorry, uh, I'd like to yield the five minutes that in a rebuttal to him, so he's not interrupted. Okay. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Abraham Rodriguez. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me, for carefully reviewing the large amount of evidence that we've provided to you guys. I know that it's not a straightforward situation. I understand why uh, the medical board would be concerned in this situation. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me honestly, openly, and please, uh, please slow down. Okay. And please, uh, please carefully review the information we gave you because I won't be able to cover it in very much detail right now. Uh, so to start my story, I just wanted to share with you guys that I started uh, college. I'm born and raised in the Midwest, uh, United States. I went to college at the University of Iowa. I studied biology. Uh, I developed the goal to become a neurosurgeon because I became very fascinated by the brain, by the spinal cord, and I thought that using my hands to directly fix problems in those, uh, in those organ systems would be the most exciting and fun way for me to be a doctor. So I actually applied to medical school wanting to be a neurosurgeon ahead of time. Uh, I got into medical school uh, at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. I'm sorry. <laughs> So I got into medical school at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. I worked very, very hard. Uh, I graduated with Alpha Omega Alpha honors, one of the most prestigious honors that a medical student can receive. Um, I was elected by my student body to serve on student government for all four years. Um, I applied for a uh, research scholarship called the James Scholar Research Award where uh, my idea was submitted along with several other medical students and it was approved. I was paired up with a physician mentor and I was able to develop a research project where we used music to study the uh, cerebral cortical activity on 30 young healthy adults. Um, it had IRB approval and funding and was a very exciting project I got to work on in medical school. Um, I also did an alternative third year curriculum that's relevant uh, to general medical practice. It's called the Rural Student Preceptor Program. And this was an alternative third year curriculum where I worked directly with attending physicians. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Please do. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Uh, the alternative third year curriculum is called the Rural Student Preceptor Program. And this was an alternative third year curriculum where I was able to work directly with attending physicians in internal medicine, family medicine, ob gyn and general surgery. And so I, the reason I chose this approach was because I didn't want to have the situation where I would be stuck just learning from residents and competing with large amounts of other residents and medical students for education. This way, as a medical student, I was able to work directly with attending physicians under direct and very close supervision, almost functioning like a resident during my third year of medical school in these primary care general practice specialties. So it was very strong, powerful experience, and it really set me up to have a successful fourth year as well, where I was functioning at a higher level than many of my medical student colleagues. Um, I was involved in many extracurricular activities, including AMA, our AMA chapter, uh, tons of community service, um, but please, we've already provided that too, so I'll keep going for the sake of time. Uh, I started neurosurgery residency after successfully matching into one of my top five programs uh, in July of 2013. That was the University of Missouri. I was unaware of the uh, the issues that the program was having at the time. Okay. Um, things were going very well for my first year. 
Uh, I was getting great feedback. Uh, my program director, Dr. Litovsky, felt that I was on track uh, after the first year, and that's documented in the evaluations that were provided to you. Um, he said there was no issues, but towards the end of that first year, uh, there was some issues developing with uh, duty hours. Uh, for example, we were being worked well over the 80 hour uh, limit that's required by the ACGME federal regulatory body. We were being worked 100, 120 hours a week, working with very little sleep uh, in a very unsafe manner, in my opinion. And I was told to chart my hours honestly so that these issues would be caught because the hours were reported directly to the ACGME. So I reported those hours honestly, and it started to create a lot of tension between the program director and the chief resident and myself. And when I asked the other residents, how are you guys keeping your hours under 80 hours a week? They just told me straight to my face that they were lying about their hours. They chose to under-report their hours to keep Dr. Latowski from taking punitive action against them. Um, so aside from that, the first year went well and, uh, and things were on track. Um, but shortly after starting my second year, I graduated from my first year, was promoted to the second year. Uh, the ACGME actually came and did a site visit to inspect and investigate our program. Some of this was related to the duty hours issues. Uh, some of this was related to resident intimidation and poor working conditions, poor service uh, to education imbalance. Um, and all those things are documented in the ACGME citation we provided. Um, but in, in particular, there was two citations where I am mentioned specifically, not by name because they kept me anonymous, but I'm specifically mentioned uh, on page four and the other one is on page five. And there was a situation involving a Saturday operation that I told the ACGM out, ACGME about where I was pressured uh, to work past my duty hours, uh, as well as a situation where uh, Dr. Litovsky expressed some something that suggested to the ACGME site visitors that he would potentially be retaliating against me for some comments I made to the ACGME uh, expressing my concerns to them. So just want to highlight those citations for you guys. And that's just a picture of uh, the first page of the document we shared with you guys. It's the official ACGME citation and that was delivered to us by the program coordinator, Allison Gorman. Okay. You have about four more minutes. Okay. Uh, following that site visit and the uh, citations involving me specifically, my relationship with Dr. Litovsky and the chief residents started to deteriorate pretty rapidly. Uh, it became very tense. I was accused of being slow, even though I shared with Dr. Litovsky that everyone was being overworked, but I was the only one that was honestly reporting it. He didn't seem to be responsive to that concern, and he just continued to say that I was slow and inefficient. Um, I was eventually given a letter of warning in May of 2015, but despite that, I was then graduated out of the second year and allowed to start my third year in July of 2015. Uh, I was given a list of things to improve on. I worked really hard to try and improve on those things, uh, but despite that, in October of 2015, I was then placed on probation. Uh, the second ACGME site visit came to follow up in regards to their first visit, and they extended many of the citations and also issued a couple new ones, uh, further documenting the issues that I was concerned about in the program. Uh, I then took my written American Board of Neurological Surgery board exam. I took it in uh, my third year, even though we don't have to take it till the end of residency, and I scored very high. I scored 505, and minimum passing was only 311. Um, and I was told by one of my attending physicians, Dr. Messvin, that this was the highest score in the history of the University of Missouri Neurosurgery Program. I can't vouch that that's true. That's just what he told me. But I do mean that in all honesty that he told me that. So and you can see in this next uh, image, which the board already has a copy of, that the scores each year went up. We take that exam for uh, self-assessment. There we go. The first two years, and you can see my score is improving, and then I got to take it for credit my third year, which is when I achieved the score of 505. Uh, following that, in July of 2016, I was graduated out of my third year and allowed to start my fourth year, even though I was on probation. And so clearly I was improving, in, in my opinion. Otherwise, I would not have been given more responsibility, allowed to do uh, increasing complexity of clinical encounters and cases. Uh, Following that, in summer and fall of 2016, I had uh, a uh, my second rotation at our satellite campus in Springfield, Missouri, 
And there I got to work with seven attending physicians who I did not have that interpersonal tension with. And all of them, all seven of them, told me in different variations that I was doing very well, that I was either at my level of training or ahead of my level of training compared to other residents that had rotated there. In fact, uh, several of them actually wrote me letters of recommendation, not just general letters of recommendation, but letters of recommendations, sorry about that, letters of recommendation specifically to help me continue my neurosurgery training at another program if it, would, if it did not work out here. And so um, we've provided those letters too as well. And each one of those letters has some very important information in them. For example, some of those attending physicians actually document the interpersonal issues and tension between myself and the chief resident, for example, in addition to testifying to my surgical and clinical and patient care abilities. Uh, following that, I returned uh, I returned to the University of Missouri main campus in Columbia, and I received positive feedback from several of the attendings at that campus as well. And several of them, all, or two of those five, so I received letters of recommendation from all seven of the attending neurosurgeons who trained me at the Springfield campus, and I also received two letters of recommendation of the five uh, core faculty at the University of Missouri. So out of my 12 attending physicians that trained me, I received letters of recommendation from nine of them. Um, and so I was, and I, we also have letters of recommendation all the way down to the level of nurses. So from residents, from attendings, from nurses, uh, people that worked with me very directly. So please, please uh, just look closely at those if you haven't already. Um, as I mentioned in October, I returned to the Columbia campus, the main campus, and I was told by Dr. Mesfin and by Dr. Norgard that I would be taken off probation soon. Um, Following that, uh, Dr. Latovsky administered this unofficial peer assessment to evaluate my interpersonal relationship with other residents, and this was a follow-up to one he had administered in June. So he did one in June and repeated it in November, and my scores went up. And when that was revealed to me, I said, hey, so everything's better. Surgically is great, clinically is great, interpersonal relationships are great. You know, I hear I'm coming off probation, you know, what's happening? And he told me that that evidence was not going to be entered into my file because a new resident had started at the program and he felt that that presence of the new resident had artificially improved the results. So that's actually not an official part of my file. We had to request that from the coordinator. Right. You, you, you've used the time allotted to you, but I'd like to make sure, uh, see if there are any questions from the panel members for you about the presentation you've made before I invite Mr. Mercer to speak. Sure. Yes, Dr. Nanadev. Uh, is he going to finish before I ask, or uh, just can I start asking? I think you should go ahead and ask. Yeah. Uh, I went through your entire uh, application. Uh, there are a couple issues. Number one is that uh, you knew that probably by, by second year that there are problems in the program. Weren't you, why didn't you look to really get out of their program and go elsewhere? And then my second question is, uh, uh, what happened in Massachusetts when you, uh, when you got an uh, uh, offer and then was you, were oh. you denied the license? That's a great question. Um, so part of the reason that I continued in the program at that time around the second year, when I started to notice issues and some of the higher residents that actually left the program, eventually they warned me, they said, He's, he's doing the same thing to you, he's doing to me, I'm leaving. So I was actually warned about what was happening, but part of it was naivety, I'll be honest about that, that I, part of me believed that if I just worked hard, said yes sir, right away sir, and just gave it everything, didn't argue, just listened and did the best job I could, I thought that he would warm up to me. It sounds silly, but I honestly thought I'd graduate from that program with him saying this was the best resident we ever had. So. Um, but later on in things, towards the third and fourth year, once I did well on boards and started to get strong letters of recommendation from some of the attendings, I started to realize that this wasn't really going to get better. Um, but I still decided not to leave, honestly, because part of that is that I didn't feel like it was the right thing to do to the other residents. I didn't want to leave the team shorthanded when we already were shorthanded. Uh, part of that was also because I, I didn't really think that I would actually get let go. I thought that worst case scenario, I'd graduate with tension, as other residents have been able to do in the past. So, um, so those are the two main reasons. And then what happened in Massachusetts? So after uh, I was uh, pressured to resign slash uh, 
told that my contract would not be renewed. I called every neurosurgery program in the country twice and submitted applications all over the place. And that's how I got the position at, uh, in Burlington, Massachusetts at Leahy Medical Center. And um, he was understanding, the program director there was very understanding of the issues with the program because they're quite common in neurosurgery residencies. Uh, so that was not the case, but he said when we were getting, I had already signed a contract, we were preparing to submit for licensure uh, in Massachusetts, and it was when he spoke to the medical board and they reviewed my application, they, they told him, and I'm trying to paraphrase here, that it would take approximately six months to get my medical license approved there, but he said that they needed me to be able to start within two to three months at latest. And so they rescinded the job offer and, and removed the contract. And that's actually, oh, I could stop there if you'd like, but, okay, thank you. Dr. Bullock. No, uh, Dr. Ganana, they have asked my questions. Thank you. All right, Ms. Pine. Dr. Krauss, Ms. Lawson. All right, then with that, I'll actually, I'll turn the floor over to Mr. Mercer. Uh, what would you like to tell the panel? Thank you, good morning. Uh, just to give you a perspective from uh, the board's licensing program perspective, uh, this was uh, an application that we received as we received many applications every year from medical graduates all over the country. Uh, this one had unusual circumstances and that's what they're called on the application. They're called unusual circumstances during postgraduate education. And that is what caused the question in the licensing program's mind. Now this was not a decision that was made by uh, a clerical employee, uh, a bureaucrat or an administrator. This was a decision on which we relied uh, on a very knowledgeable person. That would be James Nuovo. Dr. Nuovo is um, someone who has 30 years experience in providing postgraduate medical education. He has been the assistant dean of the U uh, University of California Davis Medical School. He has been the designated institutional officer, which is an ACGME role, in which he has overseen 60 different programs similar to the neurosurgery program that the applicant was involved in. Uh, Dr. Nuovo is also, in addition to being experienced, objective. He has no reason to find fault with any particular applicant, but he examines the information that he gets. And the information that he gets are, is, comes from an accredited ACGME program and is reliable information and in fact is the kind of information that medical schools and postgraduate residency programs rely on in making decisions whether to accept uh, gentlemen like the applicant. So this was reliable information and looking at the type of deficiencies that were identified in the University of Missouri program of concern was the fact that these 10 areas that were identified are areas that involve being able to listen, being able to communicate with other team members regarding a patient, being able to accurately describe what's going on with the patient and to identify key factors in the patient's case, either from the clinical history, the examination, or the imaging. These are the kinds of deficiencies that apply to any physician practicing in the most general of practices. And that was Dr. Nuovo's concern. Now you've heard uh, extensive uh, information today about the University of Missouri program and the applicant's concern about the, that program. There are a couple of things that we would point out. Um, we would point out that the Deficiencies that were identified in the applicant's performance were individual deficiencies. That is, that they relate to his ability to listen, his ability to communicate clearly, his ability to identify key factors in each patient's presentation. They didn't relate to wh whether the program itself, uh, items that the program would be responsible for. Uh, in contrast, 
the areas identified by the ACGME of concern were lack of scholarly output by the faculty and a number of institutional issues in addition to the concern about Dr. Litovsky, who yes is mentioned by name in the ACGME uh, reviews. But only Dr. Litovsky is mentioned and it's important to note that the institutional deficiencies that the ACGME was concerned with never refer to the applicant Abraham Rodriguez. He is never referred to, nothing in this review is specific to him, albeit he had an ACGME grievance procedure available to him, he never filed a grievance. Year after year, negative review after negative review, when he was found to be at still the beginner level after three years of postgraduate training in neurosurgery, he did not file a grievance. Now this grievance procedure is provided for so that the applicant, if he believes that his program director in the department is biased against him, he can go outside the department to the DIO, which is the position that Jim DeWovo had at UC Davis. He can get an objective review of what's going on with me in my department and is this fair? And he didn't do that. So he's put the board at a disadvantage in coming here and asking you to assume that the program was the problem and not him because he didn't get that objective review that would tell us what the findings were of someone who was there and could interview the witnesses and could do an investigation. The board does not have the capability to investigate the goings on at every medical school in the country, most of which are outside its subpoena power its ability to bring witnesses. We couldn't bring Dr. Litovsky here to explain what it was he observed. He's five states away and outside our subpoena power. Um, I'd like to move on to the board's questions because I think that that was the concern was, first of all, should he be licensed? And that comes down to your own assessment using your experience as to whether these areas of deficiency would cause you concern from a consumer protection standpoint to have someone who has problems listening, communicating, identifying key factors in a patient case, whether that person should be licensed. If you get past that and say, yes, he's got the minimum qualifications, uh, he should be licensed, then there's the question of should he have a license with no restrictions? The purpose of postgraduate medical education is to progressively train a physician so that by the end of the program, the physician is able to practice independently without supervision. He did not complete that program. Therefore, the board may want to consider the fact that under Business and Professions Code Section 2221, the board has the authority and the duty, if it sees fit, to impose a condition that the physician only work in a supervised practice for a certain number of years after being licensed. This would, in essence, provide a, Cal a California physician reporting to the board and advising the board, yes, I'm watching what Dr. Rodriguez is doing. He's rehabilitate himself, he's able to listen, he's able to identify key factors in patient cases, he can communicate effectively with other care providers involved in the patient's care, or not. But that would be a safeguard that the board could consider. And uh, that's my presentation, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. We'll see if the board has any questions for you. Seeing none to my right. Any questions here to my left? All right. Yeah. No questions from the panel then. Uh, Mr. Firestone, Dr. Rodriguez, you've used the time that the panel had allotted to you, but before we conclude, I will make sure that no questions for the, of the panel for you have arisen based on what Mr. Mercer said. Dr. Ganadeth? Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Dr. Rodriguez, what's your future plans in California? I saw that you want to do some res residency or work for some company. So what exactly are the plans you're looking at? That's a great question. So uh, do you mind if I share why I came here in the first place as part of that answer? Is that okay? Okay. So after the, uh, the job offer was rescinded in Massachusetts, my house had already sold in Missouri. And so I had to be out of there within roughly two, three weeks after that job offer was rescinded. And the only two job opportunities I had were here in California. One was that I was offered an interview at the UC Davis Neurosurgery Residency Program. They, they reviewed my file and they felt that I would be a good candidate for a clinical fellowship there. And if I did well in that, I would enfold into their residency program. And I also had a friend who has a plant-based preventative medicine biotechnology startup company here called Green Tech Laboratories in Novato. And she offered me a position doing clinical research with them if I could get my medical license here. So given that my only two job opportunities and good ones, in my opinion, were here, I chose to come here instead of moving with my mother in Minnesota after that job offer was rescinded in Massachusetts. So I came here. And during the couple weeks of coming out here after all the situation that happened, it allowed me to do some soul searching. And that's why I chose to turn down the UC Davis interview. I felt like perhaps I wouldn't be happy in the field of neurosurgery and the chances of finding a place where I could also impact people with education and prevent them from possibly needing the surgery in the first place seemed more attractive to me. So I turned down that interview and took the job with Green Tech Laboratories, applied for the medical license. And when that was denied, the, that job offer was also rescinded, unfortunately. So if I uh, am fortunate enough to have my medical license here, I'm considering going back to another residency. I would, I'd like to consider a radiation oncology residency to treat people's brain tumors in a non-invasive approach. Um, perhaps a preventative medicine residency to treat people through the power of uh, diet, exercise, and uh, more preventative means. Um, otherwise, possibly doing clinical research in industry. Uh, there's a lot of great companies here that are doing great things, uh, such as spinal cord stimulators, uh, healthcare technology companies, um, and so uh, things like that are the things I'd be considering. Any other questions to my right? Any other questions from the panel? All right, seeing none, then that will conclude our argument this morning. Thank you very much for being here. We'll go off the record.